are live. What is going on, guys? Welcome to the second interview of the official Jobs Gamach group. With yeah, us the first. What? I should have been the, have been the first. Come on. Have been. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> You'll, uh, this is going to be. This is the one people the first remember. Of its kind. So. The, the first, first of, of its, its kind. kind. There we go. Yeah, it's all good. Okay. All right, welcome to the first of its kind interview with Chaim <laughs> Shapiro. He's the director of the Office for Student Success at Turo College, and he's going to help us land our dream job. What's going on, Chaim? Thank you very much for coming on. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being here. And it's a real pleasure because I know things are very difficult. And I've seen it. The job that I do at Turo College and Student Success, probably about 90% of the work I do is career services related work. So I'm helping students with resumes, new interviewing, and setting them up with jobs. A lot of students had offers rescinded for internships over the summer, and opportunities just sort of disappeared. Gotten a little bit better in the last month and a half, two months, but uh, March, April were just some of the most devastating times in terms of employment that I've seen. I've been working in this field for about 12 and a half years. Wow. So when you say an internship disappeared, that means they were all set up to go, and they were registered, and they were just told sorry. So there were a few of those. There are a number of people who were basically said they're in the queue waiting to be accepted and then the offers never came. There were a few also that had actual offers rescinded and had to find other things last minute. So I had never seen that before. You know, I'd seen times where it was difficult for people to find opportunities and internships. I've never seen it where people had things rescinded and agreements sort of not followed. And I understand why the companies had to do it. A lot of them weren't right. set up for the remote kind of internship experience that you need to provide to students. So. They really had no choice. Right, right. It doesn't make your job easier, that's for sure. It, it doesn't, but you know something, challenges are part of life. And yeah. I guess you don't take a leadership position unless you're willing to face the challenges. All right, awesome. That sound, you sound awesome. <laughs> so, you, you, uh, so what exactly do you do? So let's say somebody in, um, in Turo wants, is finished with their college degree, and now they're ready to get a job. Now what? So, so I would say that's the first mistake. I try to get students in there literally as soon as they get on campus because, first of all, career direction is exceptionally important. Uh, a lot of students have an idea what they want to do. And look, I've seen this a number of times where students don't meet with me and they're graduating and like, yeah, I never really wanted to be an accountant, but my degree is finished in accounting. And had we had the opportunity to meet two and a half, three years earlier, we could have come up with some plans, get an idea of what the person wanted to do to be more in line with his or her passions and skills. A lot of times people come to school, my mother wants me to be, my father wants me to be, everyone says I should be. And those can be good pieces of advice, but it also can be very bad pieces of advice because everyone's an individual and their skills lend themselves and their passions lend themselves to different things. So I want to get them in there as soon as I can, just have a conversation. Good percentage of them have an idea. Some of them have absolutely no idea. So we start with the career direction. Where do you want to go? And just work it through the process, career direction to interviewing and I'm sorry, to resumes, interviewing, networking, LinkedIn to actually submitting the resumes to jobs and having job fairs on campus twice a year. Right. So your job is twofold. So first understand the person, what their strong points are and what they really want to do. And then next to match them up with the correct position. Right. I sort of as a whole service of uh, all career, from career direction to actually basically what these are called placement, but making sure they have positions at the end. And thank God our, we really don't call it a placement rate anymore, but our first destinations, meaning students who are in a job or in graduate school six months after graduations have been very, very high. So we've been very happy with that. Right. So when somebody comes to you, so they're in college, right? So our audience is not necessarily in college, but I mm -hmm. think it's the same game for them. You know, they have to figure out what they want to do. And they also then have to get themselves a job just without a degree. So they're, you know, doing the same game, just in a different right, arena, right, let's right. say. So what would you suggest someone do to figure out what type of job is good for them? Well, I guess it really depends where they are in their career. If somebody's been working in something for a long period of time, I think you need to think significantly before giving that up for something else, even potentially if you've lost a position. You know, if you're looking for something brand new, sometimes you have to start at the bottom floor. And that might be, not be key, something that person's capable of when they have a family, they have more responsibilities. So you have to really consider, not only is it this what I want to do, but this is something that I can do because I have the experience working 10 years in sales or accounting or whatever. Will I be able to get a position in something else that I do want to do more that'll be able to pay me at the same level as somebody who has that much experience? So that's one of the first conversations I think we need to have. And the same thing is true with students. You know, I get students that come in and a primary concern is, well, how much money will I make in a particular profession? 
completely understandable because we all know how much an Orthodox life costs. It's very, very expensive and you need to be at the top end of wage earners just to make it. But I usually tell people that's the wrong focus to start with. And we need to get there because we need to make sure you have a position that you're going to be able to support yourself. But let's find out where your passions are first and then try to backfit it and find what you can do that will allow you to utilize those passions and make the kind of money. So that's probably where I would go first with the person who's looking for a position. What do you enjoy doing? What have you been doing? Can we use any of the skills you've been utilizing for the last 10, 15 years and translate that into something else where you're able to take a much more senior level than you would if you were starting again from the beginning? Uh, very interesting. So you want them to follow their passion, but at the same time to be able to eat. So you have to come something that, yeah. you know, you can't close. eat your passion. Yeah. Your passion does not <laughs> feed your family, does not pay your tuition. <laughs> tuition. Try to go to the tuition committee. What are you paying with passion? No, not going to go. Yeah. So right. there has to be reality to it. Look, there definitely has to be reality to it. And look, is it the perfect scenario that people have to, have to choose based on financial uh, you know, considerations? It's part of life. I mean, generally, at some point, you have to make those choices because there are certain things that really aren't in, in the realm of possibilities simply because they don't make enough money. Right. You can't uh, necessarily just be an editor or a blogger, you know, to support a family of seven. Well, I will tell you that one of the things I see on LinkedIn all the time, there's a lot of women, especially, who are doing that as side jobs, copywriting and editing and blogging and all those things, are making a significant living in doing so as a freelance. So there is that opportunity there. And these are people who are able to utilize what they love and what they're great at in a way sort of out of the traditional job system and the freelance system or opening their own businesses. They've been very successful with that. So I wouldn't tell people to give up on that dream. The, the question is figuring out a way to make it work. Right. So would you suggest if somebody comes over to you, just got a degree and their strong points you notice are in something that does not need a degree at all, would, right. you, would you tell them to ditch the degree or would you tell them to, you know, you, you earned the degree, you spent time getting it. You wouldn't say to just ditch it, first try that out and then move forward. Well, so look, I would say always this. You want to do where your passion go, especially when you're first starting. Start off where your passions are. I mean, if you have a degree, like things like business and finance, I was a history major, which lends itself to absolutely nothing. So I could have chosen anything. But if you have an accounting degree and you're set for accounting, but accounting is also the foundation of business. So there are a lot of other things you can do with it. Uh, if you want to go into law, for example, and people who have a background in accounting can be very valuable to law firms because they understand business because they have the foundations of it. So I try to tell them, see if there's a way you could swing what you've studied into something that allows you to be more successful in whatever it is you choose to do. But I wouldn't advise somebody to keep following the career path that they don't like just because they have the degree and put the time in. Right. So, so you, you would tell someone to, to, to I'm saying you would, I would say to try to utilize all the skills in the best way that you can from what you learned and what you studied, but find something where your passion is and start doing that. Cause look, the degree is always going to be there. You have that degree behind your name. It did provide education and experience and hopefully some soft skills as well that you can utilize anywhere. So again, you know, it's a little bit harder if somebody goes to medical school and finished their, their and I know something this happened to, uh, just called me a few months ago. He finished as an MD and he didn't like it. But yeah, his, he is an MD, but he has no internship, no residency. Uh -huh. Like, what do you do with that? And I, I didn't have, an, it wasn't a Charles student, but I didn't really have an answer for that because there's not much you could really, yeah, well, there's not much you could really do with that outside of being an MD. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a very difficult situation for him. Right. So you help people, you help place people. So you first help them figure out again where they should go and then you actually place them. So, yeah, so I wouldn't say place. Placement is sort of, a, it's become sort of a, a word we don't want to use because it takes away the agency of the person who's actually doing the application. In other words, I could submit a resume to first student. The student still has to make sure that they go, they do the interview, they're presenting themselves appropriately and they're the ones getting the job. I never want to be the one person saying, yeah, I you place them the opportunity. There. You place right. them we give, give them the opportunity placement. and then they, they got, and that's part of the, the goal of what we're working on is that we make sure they're prepared, they know how to dress and know how to be prepared for a video interview, you know how to prepare for a regular interview and know how to be prepared for success once they actually get into the job. Right. So when you place them in that opportunity, is it just based on you meeting with them or is it that you have an idea of what jobs are available and you could sort of fit them? Like, so let's say somebody does not have you in their life. Right. Right. Is it possible for them to figure out what they should go into without having you? Well, look, I think people do. The question is whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing. Right. One of the things I do on the side, I do a lot of career counseling for people who are in Yeshiva or leaving Yeshiva or Kolo, leaving Kolo. And what I found, you know, a lot of people have these ideas. They want them to take these tests and figure out what they're good at. Ninety nine percent of the people I've met with, this is true at Toro as well, by the way, they know what they want to do. They might be afraid to say it because it's not the standard thing that people do. 
but they know what they want to do, but they're afraid they won't make enough money. What will my mother say? What will my father-in-law say? Those kind of considerations get into it, but the vast majority of the time, they actually know what they want to do. And I think people need to be able to be in touch with themselves. Don't discredit and discount what you want to do just because you think it can't work or because someone tells you you can't work. Do the research. Now, it's, is it possible it can't work? It's definitely possible. But why ignore that option just because you're assuming that because then you're limiting yourself for no particular reason. Right. Also, I just put in that uh, a lot of new types of job opportunities that haven't been around in the times of most people's parents are up. So if you're going to ask your parents for advice, they'll tell you not to do it because it sounds weird. You know, you're either an accountant, a lawyer or a doctor or you have a storekeeper, right? Right. Starting an Amazon business. Someone who's 50 years old and be like, I don't know, it doesn't sound like a good idea. Yeah, or, or, or social media. You know, it's interesting. I lived in Los Angeles for about six years after I got married. There are a number of people who are from who work in Hollywood in different capacities. Very few are actors, but produce d- during production, law, graphic design, all sorts of things on sets and things. And like you think of like the thing that sounds the least Jewish profession you can imagine is working in Hollywood. But there were a number of people at the show that I went to who were working in different capacities in Hollywood, and they made a great living doing so. And they're very happy in, in terms of what they were doing. So I think people try to limit themselves. You know, I used to have uh, this idea for a T-shirt for a first date that says OTPT or special ed on it. So you can eliminate the first, <laughs> eliminate the first date question, you know. So what is, she, what is she going to do? There's no reason for people to limit themselves to the so-called from professions because there are so many other things out there. Look, I do LinkedIn on the side. And, you know, for most people, it's like, what is that? Why are you doing it? You know, I've never even heard of this social media stuff, but there are so many opportunities out there that are new. And I think whoever comes up with the next opportunity is the ones that are really going to make a lot of money. Uh-huh. So you would, so you would, you're, you're suggesting that someone doesn't necessarily need uh, a person to bounce off ideas or it needs a person that's connected. A person just needs to be honest and open with himself and explore the opportunities that are in front of him. And I, I just think want to know, lot, does yeah. someone need to know the person that knows the opportunities that are available or could someone possibly, even though maybe it's not mm-hmm. the best situation, figure it out by himself? Well, I would say this, people can figure it out by themselves, but a lot of people have a little trouble getting in touch with what they're really thinking. So speaking to somebody who knows how to get them in touch with their thinking is very important. I have a background in counseling, which I think is very helpful in this field because I know how to sort of reflective listen and try to get to what the person's coming to. Can people do it on their own? Yes, but again, we're always faced by our own biases. Whatever, I just had a decision I had to make about something with work small little thing, kind of thing I would give someone advice on in a moment if it wasn't me, but because it was me, I was completely blinded to all of the repercussions right. and the, you know, the, to the pros and the cons. So it, it really can help to talk to someone, even for a short period of time, who gives you permission to understand who you are and what you want to do can be very helpful. It unlocks those potentials for you. Uh, then on the other hand, with the second half of the question, when it comes to finding jobs, look, it's always better if you have somebody who knows it, but there's opportunities to find jobs on the side in, in addition to that. LinkedIn has just tons of jobs available and job boards. But obviously the best way to find a job is through networking. People that you know, people that are in your show, people that are in your community who are working at a particular company who can get your resume past what we call the slush pile, you know, the big group of resumes that come in and to the hiring manager's hand so she or he can actually see you and get you past some of the, the firewalls that have preventing people from getting through. All right, and interesting. So you would suggest that somebody meets with someone just to take away his own biases figure out what they want to do and then explore the option and not necessarily wait for a job to come across your inbox, but to create relationships. Oh, you got to be, you got to be proactive. If you wait for a job to come across your inbox, you're going to be waiting a very, very long time. And I'll even say this, you know, what I used to say is, you know, the, the worst thing about uh, email is that it's so easy to send resumes. And the best thing about email is it's so easy to send resumes. People are applying to jobs. <laughs> they shouldn't be applying to. Well, it's true. They right. shouldn't be applying to, but they're able to do it. Like when I first was looking for a job, more years ago than I care to count at this moment, when I first got married, it cost me a dollar or so to send out each resume because I had to get the resume paper, the printing, the resume envelope, and a stamp. So I only sent it to places I was really interested in. Nowadays, you, know, you can send the resume anywhere. It's very, very simple. And people send it, but that also means there's more competition for those jobs. You have to be proactive. You have to look for the jobs. I tell students all the time, set up job alerts on Google or on LinkedIn. So it emails you whenever opportunities match your criteria and then find people who are working in those companies and utilize them as your way in. Right. So it's just interesting. The, the problem with email sounds like these people are skipping your first step, that they're not so focused in on what they want. They're just waiting for a job. So they skip over that. Right. And then any opportunity, they're just emailing away. And then 
it leads them to first of all not necessarily getting the best job and then also not performing well in the interview if you if you don't have a specific right, purpose right. why you're showing up to this interview except for that it was an opportunity so yeah. then the interview won't go well but if like what you said you figure out what you want to do you speak to someone and then apply in a very purposeful manner your opportunities will will even though you'll be applying to less places we will have a higher chance of getting in because you'll right. be a better interviewee and uh you'll only be a yeah, even, even a better chance of getting the interview you're just sending resumes in i mean google gets i think a thousand or fifteen hundred resumes a day for example as a company and how do you compete in that pile if you don't have somebody putting your resume in for you it is very very difficult and just sending we call it spray and break where you just you know sit there and you spray your resume out to all these different places and you hope something comes out of it now the numbers that they talk about in career services is that maybe one to two percent of jobs are done through that means we just sort of spray and pray resumes and the vast majority do not come that way. Using a proactive strategy is always the best way to do it. Talking to people, networking with people is always a better way to do it than just sending the resumes. And yes, you also find things that you're much more targeted for. But, you know, look, I understand those are the things. You know, if you're out of a job and you need a job, you want to get a job. So mm -hmm. there are survival jobs people have to take where they're looking, I need to find something and they want to find something. And I definitely understand that. But again, if you have the opportunity to look for something that would be to your benefit and something you enjoy doing. That's definitely the better way to go. Right. I think it's also good for your uh, sleep at night. Yeah, <laughs> there's no question about it. You look, you know something? If you work over a 40 year career, you know how many work days you have? Too many. Well, think about it. <laughs> the average is 250 work days a year yeah. over 40 years. That's about 10,000 work days. And look for, for and, and Corona has been a little different, but for me, usually it's an hour each way on the train. So that's an extra two hours and you have to wake up early, go to chakras and like this, it's a lot. And you're spending 80,000 hours of your life at work. Much easier if you're enjoying that than if you absolutely don't like that's it. That's definitely all. true. You're enjoying what you're doing and it's better to enjoy what you're doing because you're going to be happier and probably better at it. Right, right. So it all starts again with knowing what you want and not just trying to grab that's whatever grab job that there. comes your yeah. way. Right. Again, I understand if you have to because you have to. I mean, we all needed a job. I was out of work for a little period of time about uh, before I started at Toro. I was applying everywhere, Kmart, you know, whatever I could find because I needed to bring in money. But that wasn't where my passion was, obviously. Right. So maybe even get that, you know, first job. Survival, the survival bills, job. The survival job. And then yeah. from there, try to get another move from there. Exactly. That, that's usually what I advise people. If you're in the position where you need to get a job, get what you can, get the experience, get the paycheck, more importantly, and potentially the insurance and then try to move into something that you're more passionate about. Because yeah. right. if you're always waiting, well, this is not the perfect job, then you can be waiting a very, very long time. Right. So if it's so more, so more, if it's more effective to uh, network and get hired, not necessarily within, but through your connections, why do companies you know, use job boards like the way they do? If Well, th there are a couple of reasons. First of all, I do get some applications that way. Uh, the other thing is there's also legal things involved. My, my sister does employment law. And there are certain requirements and things that they have to do in terms of posting and making sure it's readily available to people. And if they're hiring people from outside the country that it was made available, there's a whole bunch of legal things that are available. Plus, look, when you put it on the job board, that's where people who are, are interactive and effective find it and then reach out to somebody else. So there's a legal component to it, which I don't really fully understand, but also that's how they start promoting it. But yes, they are going and expecting people to go around their sort of firewalls and, and find people to apply. Look, nowadays, one of the newest things in a lot of these companies is they're on social media. They have social media people looking for talent on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter, on TikTok, unfortunately. They're looking for people that might make great employees working right. for their company. And they find people that way. And it's not just about the degree and the fact that you apply, but they're proactively seeking that out. Interesting. So when someone sees a job on a jobs board, so you might recommend that they reach out to the company personally through social media channels instead of just applying with everyone else. Yeah, that's one way. I think the better way to do it is to find out, do I know somebody who works there? Is there somebody in my shoulder that works there? Is there somebody I know who works there that can get my resume potentially in past the firewall of the initial evaluation and the ATS systems that they use? Because that already breaks down a bunch of walls and gets it higher consideration. I also advise people to do what are called informational interviews. So informational interviews, when you basically call someone up and say, I want to talk to you about how to be successful in the field. It's funny because people used to think this is a way of like sort of sneaking in saying, I'm going to really, I'm really applying for a job. But I don't want you to know that. You're not fooling anybody with informational interviews. They all know what you're there for. Okay. We all get it. But the point is once they see you and interact with you, 
you have the opportunity to make an impression on them. Plus, once you talk to them, I also always say the final question is, who else should I be speaking to? Because the people in the field know the other people in the field who can build that network for you. That could be the valuable way to get those jobs in the end. You're not fooling anybody like, oh, I didn't know he really wanted a job. Is that why he's meeting with me? Yeah, that's why he's meeting with you. Right. So you basically put yourself out there. Put yourself, put yourself out there. Put and your body people. in front of them. But well, again, in a professional way and with respect for their time and respect in sending them thank you emails and making sure you're presenting yourself 100% professionally. Yes. But the more people you talk to, the more people you engage with, the better your opportunities for finding jobs. Right. I actually know people that got jobs that way that they put themselves in as a substitution and, you know, that was not really fit for the job, but said, but they were desperate. I think like someone had died and yeah. uh, he knew, he said, I'll fill the position until you can right. fill with someone more, you know, that's, that's more fit for the job. And they liked the work that he did and he got the job. Right. Yeah. Cause once you start working somewhere and they see how good you are, that's a great way to move up. We have a lot of times we have seasonal positions. So I have some students in accounting. And I always advise them to do seasonal positions, you know, around tax season at major companies because they hire a good number of the students off of that. Because when the students come in and they do excellent work, they're like, yeah, we got to have you here full time to see how good you are. And they're just hiring people, you know, because they need the, the body is to do the extra work. But once you go in there, and you're doing great things. Yeah, and they see that. That's a great way to make sure that they're interested in you long term. Right. So basically just put yourself in a position to succeed and yeah. not necessarily. And just, yeah. Proactive, but not stalking. You're not calling right. them. I, I saw somebody post on LinkedIn that you should show up at somebody's office and start walking. And I'm like, no, don't do that. <laughs> First of all, they're going to call security and it's not going to be pretty. You don't just show up. I mean, you call them, you set up appointments, you talk to them, you engage them, you know, because if you're just asking for something, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder. But when you're actually more about you know, what can I learn from you? What can you, what, I want to learn and understand things from you. People tend to be more receptive to those kinds of things. Right. But one of the other questions I often get is, well, you know, you work in career services, I mean, you, you know a bunch of jobs. How come you're not just sitting there sending resumes and everyone who sends it to you right into, not say Toro people, but people that I don't know. I'm looking for a job. Oh, can you send it in to so-and-so at a particular company? So why do you think it is that I don't, I'm not so quick to do that? Well, then you'll lose all the respect for whatever you do send in. That's right. Because when I and send you're not in really a resume, helping them either. you're probably not helping them. But the point is, my word is means something. As when I say, when I call someone up and say, that I want to recommend so-and-so, that means something. I'm putting my name behind that person. If I don't know the person, maybe they have that, maybe they don't. I don't want to take that chance because if I do and they don't work out, people have claims against me and my reputation is, 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 you know, is ruined because of that. So you know, I think just asking people to send them resumes is a little bit more difficult, which is why I like the meeting idea. You know, if I meet with somebody and I see that she presents herself well and is professional, then I am much more likely to be willing to send that in because I see how the person works and how she operates. And the fact that she, and I believe she would make a good employee. Right. So a person is their best resource. You know, if somebody's looking at you as their best resource, why don't you just send in my resumes, then it's not going to work. If they could use you as, as to, to right. amplify their own resources by coming to you and, and making a good impression for you and you could pass that on, right. then they'll get the job. So, so I'm confident in passing them on, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. And, and that's true for everybody. Again, nobody wants to hand somebody in and have their boss call them in, you know, three months later. Why did you give us this person? They're not doing the job appropriately. And that's a very legitimate concern because if that happens, you know, again, you're not going to be in a particularly good place and you have to explain that away. You don't want to be in that place. Right. So I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if I made this point. When someone sees a job opportunity on a jobs board, it shouldn't be that, oh, I'll send them my resume. It should be, oh, there's an opening there. Let me see if I could get in through the side doors. Yeah, I would try probably both because a lot of them require that it actually goes through the system that's some of the legal stuff as well. But that if you could find somebody who works there or works in the department and send the resume to that person to potentially give in or ask for an informational interview. Can I talk to you about how to be successful in this position at this company? And then utilize that, leverage that into handing the resume and it is much, much more effective. Right. And Nothing's perfect, but it's much more effective. Right. Right. I mean, people could spend years sending in resumes with nothing to do. And even if it doesn't land you the job, you're, you're working on your skills, your interview skills, your interpersonal skills, and yeah. there's nothing to well, lose. So usually what I tell people, you know, if you're sending in a lot of resumes and through networking as well, and it's not working out, usually there's a problem with the resume and it might be worth having someone review it. If your resume is working, you're getting a lot of interviews, but you're not landing any jobs, there's probably a concern with your interview. And that's what it's worth seeing somebody to make sure you went in correctly. Because, you know, if something is stopping you, and again, you're not choosing the spray and pray, which is a small percentage, but if you're sending resumes to people and they're not responding, there's probably a problem in there that you need to resolve. 
And how do you move forward with resolving a problem with interviewing? Well, I think you need to practice. You know, actually, LinkedIn has a new uh, interview practice, interview prep platform. You can actually record yourself doing interviews and then send it on to people for feedback. So I think that's a great way to do it. You can see yourself in the reflection, see how you're answering it. And for yourself, that's very valuable. Plus, you could send it potentially to experts to give them, for them to give you your feedback and see how you're doing. So if you're having a problem with that, that's what I would recommend. And obviously, there are career counselors who do interview prep all the time. That's probably about 30% of the work that I do at Turo is you know, at the point of after the resume, making sure the students are really, really prepared for their interview. Uh -huh. It's just very interesting that an interview, you know, obviously it's necessary, but it's funny that an interview could make or break a job, even though it has nothing to do with your job. It's just etiquette. Yeah, oh, it seems true of the resume. Like, what does a resume really tell you? That somebody coached you on how to do the resume and the interview, okay, someone taught you how to do the interview. That's really what it comes down to. Sometimes you get a feel for a person, but yeah, but generally the system is kind of in some ways silly. And I think that's why in so some places have moved to AI where they're using artificial intelligence for actually reading video interviews, which they claim is a more effective means, whether it is or it isn't is another conversation, but it's, they claim it takes the human bias out of it. It's like, right, it puts the computer bias into it, but in at least, you know, they're trying to move in that direction because at least that way they're hoping that they can try and match fit a little bit better. And just the fact that the person who interviewed you like you. Mm -hmm. I mean, right, I would think that an interview you just have a limited amount of information and it's just a guess from the employer's perspective, but uh, if they think that AI right, can help. Yeah, well, they're using, usually they have a system by which they're grading people on particular answers and what they're looking for and the keywords and certain things that they're looking for in their answers and how they're presenting themselves and what they came on time and all those things. And they score it based on that. But there is obviously a huge, huge subjective part to it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. All right. So what are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen people make in regards so, to uh, applying? Well, I, th I think the spray and pray is, is, the, is the common mistake. I've seen a lot of people say, I've sent in 250 resumes and gotten zero responses. And normally when I talk to people like that, I'm like, it's because they're just sending in a resume to every position and they're not tailoring the resume for the position and for the job opening. Even worse is where they're doing the cover letter, which is just the same cover letter where they're cut and pasting the name of the company as opposed to making anything specific. And that's not going to be effective most of the time, again, because you're not targeting in for the job and you're just sending it to send it and you're not finding a way around that. So that's probably one of the biggest mistakes. You know, another big mistake I see people make really is, is I think the generic cover letter is something that really needs to end. Uh, I usually advise students and people not to submit cover letters unless they're required. Because I found over the years, more people hurt themselves to cover letters and help themselves. Because if you're willing to spend three hours per cover letter, per application, then it can be very powerful. But then you're writing a specific thing about each company. But if you're sending 10 applications in, how many people are spending 30 hours actually doing that? So they end up hurting themselves. The whom I may concern or Mr. So-and-so and they cut the wrong name on the bottom and the, you know, the final. <laughs> I've seen, I, I cannot tell you how many times I've seen that. Or I've actually, I have a colleague who told me that he was looking on LinkedIn for how many people put detail-oriented in their headline and spelled detail-oriented incorrectly. Thousands of hits <laughs> of different permutations of incorrect spelling of detail-oriented. It's oh, true, man. though. It happens. Less is more. Less is more. Yeah, well, it, well, it can be. But to, in this case, look, if you're applying for a particular job, target the, the cover letter and the resume to that job. That takes time. And the spray and pray method is not going to be as effective because you're just sending the same documents to, to different people over and over again that aren't even going to a human unless they go through ATS system review first. And you just them up. Right. It's interesting because one of the biggest frustrations I've heard from applicants is that they don't hear back. They'll send resumes and they just don't hear back. They don't hear that they're denied, that they're accepted. They interview. Some people said that they've taken two interviews and then get dropped. So I guess if they're on a second interview, this won't right. help them. But like what you said, if you are only applying to jobs that you feel are a fit for you, so then you'll get a much higher percentage of responses. Yeah. I, I am very critical of the employment world on this. In a day where everything runs through computers, it is not difficult to tell somebody via email that they're no longer under consideration. I like to say rejection is hard, but waiting is intolerable. People put their lives on hold, especially after a second interview. Waiting, okay, I'm not gonna go on vacation because maybe I'll hear back and they wanna call me in to get the job. Just let them know they're out of consideration. Will they be happy? No, but it's better than sitting there waiting and waiting by the computer to get the answer. I mean, just give them the answer. And I really don't understand why it's not done. It is so 
easy with computer systems. You just need to flip the switch and say, send the candidates who were rejected an email saying, thank you for your application. It's pretty simple. I do not understand why companies don't do that. I really think they should. And I don't think it's right that they don't. Right. They could even have it on an automatic response. It is, it is automatic. Every, I mean, that everyone gets denied except for the people that, and they could switch it off. I'm just right, saying, right, like, right. you don't even no, have they just to say, yeah, they, they just set it up that once they, they decide on their finalist, everyone else gets an email yes. saying that they're rejected. And once you know, went through the second interview and they go to the two or three final candidates, sends an email. What's hard? It's not hard. It's, it's, it's like, you know, it used to be more difficult when you had to call somebody up, and that's always a hard call. Now it's just an email. They should definitely be doing it. I don't see any real explanation of why they don't. Right, right. So that is definitely some, that is something I'm looking to answer. That's for sure. Um, what would you say to someone who's having an issue with age bias? You know, he has a hard time getting a job just because he's older. So obviously it's illegal, but the question is, do companies actually do it? Uh, it look, obviously you would think that it happens. You know, one of the things uh, that I advise them to do on their resumes, they might not want to put what year they graduated college or high school, because that could be a clue to people who are in a position where they want to discriminate. So if he graduated back in you know, 1975, that means he or she is, is a particular age. You know, it's a little bit better in some ways in America. We don't put pictures on resumes. So you, know, you might be able to hide your age. But again, there are people who are looking into LinkedIn profile and making assumptions based on your age. Look, if a person is going to be discriminating based on any criteria that's illegal, I don't think you want to work for them anyway. Right. Right? You know, Because what's going to happen once you get there? They're not going to treat you well most probably because they're already doing things they shouldn't be doing. So I would just move on to opportunities where people are open to everybody as they should be. You're just saying, keep up your, you know, keep your head up high. Like don't, keep your, it's not your, it's not your fault. Keep your head up high. Are there people who discriminate? Unfortunately, yes. Keep your head up high. It's not your fault. Keep applying and keep doing the right things. All we can do are the right things right. and keep doing them. You know, I have a lot of people that have called me recently. They've lost their jobs. Thank God, some of them have gotten them back over the last two months, but you know, the first month and a half in March and April. And I saw them, can't blame yourself for this, especially if you've been working a long time and you're on furlough. What are you supposed to do? I mean, this is an unprecedented situation and blaming yourself never gets you anywhere. It doesn't help you. It doesn't make you more effective. So keep your head up and just keep doing the right things. Keep plugging away. It can be difficult, and especially if you need money and money is really, really tight, but you got to keep doing the right things. Right. Is there any strategies you would tell them to employ to try to get around it or to have I mean, in terms of ageism? I, I think not putting the, some of the dates on the resume, not going to put the resume back for experiences that are very long period of time ago. Uh, I think I, I think you do need to have a picture on LinkedIn. So it's kind of hard to avoid that. But I think look, look then the focus is if they're going to discriminate against you for something that's illegal, probably not the best place to work. Right. So right. just keep going and move on to people who are willing to consider you for the skills and the talents that you bring. Right. So keep going. Would you like recommend that they take on uh, new skill sets to update like social media and things like that? Look, def that definitely can help. You know, I told people one of the things they can do on LinkedIn is a little trick where you can actually look at particular companies and what skills people list on their profiles on LinkedIn for that particular companies and particular jobs. And if you don't have those skills, it might be a good idea to add those skills because they might be looking for that on your resume or on your LinkedIn profile. So yeah, if you want to upskill, that makes a lot of sense, especially if there are things that are utilized today that, you know, that may not have been as prevalent or as common back in the day. I always find it funny when I see a resume where someone says they know how to use email. Like, okay, if you don't know how to use email, don't even bother <laughs> applying, you know, because you have to put that down or all types of internet uh, searches. Like you can, in other words, you can Google something, got it. Yeah. Okay, if you can't Google something, that'll be a problem. So you know, don't put the obvious things like that. But Less if you need is to more. Upskill, well, Less it is, is in that case, I think, because again, <laughs> yeah. you're saying I'm putting an email. Like, why are they saying that? Do they have trouble with email? And you know, if you need to upskill, you want to upskill on things that are valuable to that company and people in that company are currently have. Mm -hmm. All right, interesting. And as far as LinkedIn goes and social media platforms, so you seem to be a LinkedIn expert specifically. So yeah. what are the different ways? Because LinkedIn is a new platform, and it seems that there's a lot of things going on on the platform and different ways to, to maximize its potential. What are just the different simple ways someone could go ahead and maximize LinkedIn and is not necessarily a social media guru. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so first of all, LinkedIn has been around a very long time. LinkedIn has been around, I think there's 18, 17, 18 years. And I've been on it for about 14, 15 years. So the original purpose of LinkedIn really was job surgery. That was the original reason for the entire platform. Now, as America moved two, three years ago to almost complete employment, 
So LinkedIn sort of rebranded and Microsoft took it over and they changed their user interface and they moved much more to a B2B platform. But I do think some of the changes that LinkedIn has added over the last few months show they're moving back towards the job search platform. Uh, the ability to open to work, which is a picture frame people put on their profile now, which I don't advise, that shows some of their changes and just some changes to the profile that you're able to make your headline a little bit longer. There are certain things that they're doing that's showing they're really trying to get back into the job search market. So I do think it is a very effective thing, but I think you need to have a winning LinkedIn profile. And don't ask me to explain that in, in 20 seconds or less. If people email me, I'll send them a link 25 my, seconds. Well, basically you need to have, <laughs> you need to make sure your profile is optimized in, right. in a way that it presents you in a positive way. People want to know more, they can email me and I'll have, I have a video that I just gave last week on optimizing your LinkedIn profile for the job search. But the idea is that you don't wanna just sit back and say, my profile's here, you know, let's let things happen. There's no magic on LinkedIn. Just because you're there, things aren't gonna happen. You need to be proactive, look for those jobs. And one of the great things about the job search report on LinkedIn is it shows you people you know at that company. So you can actually go in there and say, oh, I know so-and-so that's already working in that company. And it shows you that particular lead there. But it also advises people, do content searches, see where people in your field are posting and engage those people and build a reputation as a person who really has expertise in that area that helps build your reputation as an expert. Always be proactive. You're sitting back, you know, things happen 1% of the time, 2% of the time. The proactive people tend to be much more successful when it comes to these things. Right. So you're saying engage and create content, not necessarily create content, but comment on other people's content. Comment on other people. And I also think if you can post things that have to do with your profession, absolutely. You know, this is what I think about a particular article about, you know, the, the loans that they're offering for, for small businesses, uh, how it'll work and these things. Yeah, demonstrate your expertise. The reason I say to engage people is because the people who are making the decisions that, who are posting are people you can actually interface with there and build your reputation. Are they gonna come to your posts? Maybe, but if you're engaging them, they see you. So it's much more effective in that way. Right, and on a constant basis, if you keep on popping up in their minds, and they see your resume. And you have a winning, and your LinkedIn profile is optimized. So when they see it, they're like, oh, this is an impressive person, right? Which is why it's important to have that optimized winning LinkedIn profile. Right. And what could someone do to optimize it? Is, would you suggest that they do it themselves or again, seek out a professional to make sure it looks good? Well, considering that's like my side job is working on people's LinkedIn profiles. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give a, a sell here, but that's, uh, that's what I do on weekends. So. Uh, yeah. All right. So Look, we know what it's, it's, it's not intuitive. And I will send the video. I have a video of tutorials on it. So I, I'm not trying to sell that, but people can. Right, right. No, I understand. Yeah. yeah. But, but look, it's not intuitive. So either follow the video's instructions or, or find somebody who knows how to do it because there are certain things that are not intuitive that you really need. Right. To you have to know what the company wants to see. And being that most people exactly. who are starting are not CEOs. So it's hard to know what they want. And there's some unique quirks to how LinkedIn works, you know, where, how to have a background photo how your photo shows up against the background photo and how to make your headline stand out and Unicode text. And there's all sorts of little tricks and things that aren't intuitive that can be helpful to me with something. I'm not going to, I'm not doing any hard selling. So. Right, right, right. Um, but anyone who needs should just contact you and you'll help. I, you said that, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say, I could say it again. Um, <laughs> there we go. That's why I'm not the first guy out here, right? That's why, that's yeah. why you have me second. <laughs> the, the first the of its kind. The hard, the hard, the first yeah, the of its kind. Okay, but the, the hard selling comes in the second session, not the first yeah. session. So. Yeah. Um, and is there any other way to optimize LinkedIn besides posting engaging content? Is there any other things? Because again, it seems like a lot is going on on the platform. Well, I think, well, yeah, I, I think you, you want to be engaging is really the, the upstream. Well, you need two things. I mean, your profile needs to be ready and set. So really when somebody sees it, they see it and it really presents you the way you want to be presented. But I think engaging really is the, is the way to go because that's when people actually see you. Another thing I advise people to do is connect with one person in the field who's a leader in the field because people in the field tend to know the other people in that field. We talked about that briefly before. But if I find somebody like, oh my gosh, so-and-so is an expert and I'm sitting in their field, I can actually connect with him or her and then search their connections based on that kind of company or industry and see who they're connected to in New York or Chicago or wherever when I'm looking. And that's our potential people that I want to engage or connect to as well. So I can see, oh wait, so I see the leaders are these and these people. Let's see where she's posting. I want to engage in her post and then send her a connection request. And that could be a much more proactive way of using the, the Right, the and the LinkedIn. people that engage on their posts, you could connect with them and then you could set up Absolutely, your and keep, keep, keep building the network out that way. Find people that are similar to you, people in the same field, connect with them, build those connections and build your reputation as an expert. Right, don't necessarily net, uh, connect with your friends and family 
you know, I mean, you could maybe do that also once you have your main connection set up, but mainly focus on the people where you want to work. And well, yeah, I think that's the main focus. So so there's there's really two things here. I think the first thing is you want to get to 501 connections because LinkedIn basically says you either have 373 connections. Once you get to 501, it says 500 plus, whether you have 501 or 30,000. So you want to get to that 500 plus and your friends and neighbors can be good ways to do that. But yes, as the effective strategy, you want to connect with people who are going to be able to make a difference in your life. Right. And the more you comment on people's stuff, everyone sees it and, and it repeats. And the point is consistency. If they keep on seeing right. your face, so they sort of know right. you in a weird way. And that when you, when you do it's apply- It's not even a weird way, by the way, because you know, when, you're, when you're engaging people and having conversations and you switch the conversation over to messaging, you're building real relationships. You know, I, people find this funny because uh, I'm going to date myself again. But my wife and I met in an AOL chat room in 1997. Like back in those days, like when I told one of my uncles that I met my wife online, he's like, like online at the deli? I mean, at the <laughs> bakery? I'm like, okay, well, thanks for mentioning all food places, but no, I mean, on the computer. But that was almost unheard of at that time. But the point is you can build strong relationships with people via communication online, especially now where video is possible. Back in those days, there was no video capabilities in the, in the AOL chat room. And, and it still it's still worked. It's still, Baruch Hashem, it still worked. Yeah, I married 22 years. Baruch Hashem, so. All right, so that's uh, that's some testimonial for the internet. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't advise it as a as right. a uh, as a strategy, but thank God in my case it worked very very well. Right, right, fine. So basically, just reach out, post, and engage with the people and the types of people you want to work with. Right, and build relationships. But Twitter is also a dumpster fire of people arguing and fighting with each other. However, it is also a good engagement platform potentially. Because, for example, if somebody wants to engage me, I'm a huge Chicago Cubs baseball fan, and they see my posts about the Cubs, and that's their opportunity to talk about, you know, the 2016 Chicago Cubs. You've already made me smile. I'm happy. I'm talking to this person, and I might connect them on LinkedIn. So sometimes the engagement opportunities, because the wider array of discussions on Twitter lend itself to more engagement on other things, can be valuable. But stay out of the political dumpster fire arguments and all those things. Right, right. Unless you're like, you know, class A troll, you know, so then this well, is- Well, I would stay away from, don't be the class A troll. <laughs> don't even be a class B troll. Don't, don't troll, use it effectively and, you know, right. build your reputation and your brand. But you know, there's no reason to troll people and don't get into political fights. It, right. it really, you're not convincing anybody. They're not convincing right, you. Exactly. Just leave it alone. Right. So that's also interesting that you said that uh, to make a relationship by just sharing in things that have nothing to do with what you're pursuing with the person that you're trying to pursue. Right, right. I have, a, I have lists set up on, on Twitter of my t- particular targets for different things. And when they post, I see what they post. And if there's something that I can engage with, I will. Again, if it's something I'm an expert in when it comes to baseball or sports or you know, something like that, this is my opportunity to build a relationship without asking for anything. I'm just talking to somebody who posted it publicly for everyone to respond. It's a great way to build a relationship. Then I try to move those into LinkedIn and eventually into meeting them for coffee or as things work now via Zoom. Right. And it's interesting because you do stick out from the audience because if most of their clientele or their connections are, you know, talking about software, right, and right, now right. you have this interest, you know, in 1960s yeah. films, you know, you can imagine yeah. how excited he'll get. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is. Because again, you want to make sure you're an expert. In because right. Whatever you know, about. the people, yeah, the people who know, know if you're not an expert, you're just, right. just, trying, to, just trying to do it. But yeah, it, it is a very effective means. I actually have this idea, probably a little late, but I thought of a way of like you know, the Zoom coffee meetings where you actually get a coffee delivery set up that when I have a coffee meeting with you, somebody drops a coffee off at your house five minutes before our meeting starts so we can actually make it a real coffee uh, you know, meeting. So anyway, I never did anything with it, but it was a thought that I had. Right, maybe there'll be a second wave, so don't worry. I hope, I hope not. <laughs> not I, I, I forgo the money, but I want to be healthy and well. Right, that's true. Uh, definitely forgo the money. Let's get back into 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 the office. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so so also you, people should start. You're saying it's easier to start on Twitter than it is to start on LinkedIn, or would you just? Hope it it can be. I think it depends on the person. A lot of people are are posting constantly. You now I was talking to somebody. David Statton is one of the people that's the content leader in Western Eastern Union. He's an easy guy to engage on LinkedIn because he's always posting. He always responds to posts. There are a lot of other people that post on occasion, once, twice, three times a week. And they don't really follow up with the people that are posting. So then you want to see if they're more active on Twitter and they're engaging and making comments, that can be a great way to engage them that you weren't able to do on LinkedIn. And by the way, this is a real change in LinkedIn. Up until three, four years ago, LinkedIn wasn't a great engagement tool. It was much more of an identification tool. They've really changed it and it's much better for conversations than it's ever been in the time that I've been on it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So 
So you're saying it just depends on the person. It depends, it depends on, on the person. person. It depends what works better and where you have the opportunity. Again, if the person is mentioning their 1960s uh, movies and that's your thing, and they're probably not mentioning that on LinkedIn, they're probably mentioning that on Twitter, right. there's your opportunity. You know, I, I've had engagement you know, during the World Series where somebody's posting on the World Series and you know, we're both watching the same game. So a comment there. I actually had uh, Jeff Weiner from LinkedIn, actually, I once responded to one of his tweets about a basketball game and he responded back to me. It didn't go anywhere from there, but the point was that he did. <laughs> right, but you could talk to like, them. I, I actually spoke with the guy because he responded to what I what he thought was a good response to his comment about the Golden State Warriors. Yeah. Right, okay, very cool. So would you say that the social media channels and path to a job is more effective and efficient than the old way or are they the same? Well, look, I think you have to have a multimodal approach. You don't want to just limit yourself to one thing, but obviously, you know, using social media is a great way to get beyond the gatekeepers. And also the fact that these companies now pretty much all have people dedicated to social media recruitment. It's a great way to get noticed if you know how to do it. And it's a great way to build relationships. So it's a great way to do the networking that used to be much more difficult. Instead of having to walk into somewhere and say, do you anybody know anybody at, I can find them and engage them in my own way without having to wait for somebody else to make that connection. And then again, I think eventually the, the goal is to get it into an in-person meeting or a Zoom meeting so you can really build that relationship out so the person has respect for you. And then they'll be willing to send your resume potentially, right? Right. Because that's when they know who you are. Just because I'm the guy who made the Golden State Warrior comment doesn't mean you know, Jeff Weiner is going to hire me for LinkedIn unless he knew me better. If that's he knew what I you better, he would for sure hire you. Yeah, that's right. He, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. But I'm uh, only second, not second. He wants the first interview person. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> this is all good. <laughs> so basically, it's about getting a relationship and before social media. So the way to do it was in person. That was the only way to do it. And yeah. now you just have more opportunities, which makes the old way harder. So like people should know yeah. this, that, you, that if you just email, being that there are, let's say, 100 or 1,000 people that are doing this method of social media and creating relationships, they're already right. step, two steps out of you. Yeah, so probably. you're going to get denied even more. Right. Unless, again, if you have somebody in that particular office of that company who works, you know, goes to your show, that's obviously a great way. To right. So that beats social media. That, that beats social media because, you know, the person, there's a connection, they know your family. And that's a much but more effective way. But yeah, but if you're doing it, just it's sort of shooting uh, from on your own. Yeah, I think social media is a great way because you have the opportunity to engage people in a way that you've never had before. Right. And you're also a shortcut to the job because you know the people that are handing out the jobs. So if somebody that's even... That's like knowing. Yeah, well, I mean, it's more, and you know, by the way, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, Turo has career services, but almost every college has a career services office. So if people, uh, before they start looking to hire somebody to help them with the resumes and connections, if they're an alum of a particular institution, see if they offer career services to alumni. I mean, it's a free service that people are passing up on. Not every college offers it to alumni, but they might, and they might have some services to alumni. Take advantage of that before you pay somebody to do that for you, because it's a right. great way. And they have the connections as well. So they might be able, even if, even if, it's, if they don't pay to help you, you might have to pay them to work on your resume, but they might have the connections with the employers. Mm -hmm. All right, very interesting. So is there any other way besides, let's say, social media, email, um, a community member, you know, a friend in the community or a cousin? Is there any other unconventional or conventional path to get to an, a job? I, mean, I think those are the best ways. I'm sure there are other things out there that I'm not thinking of, that, you know. But again, I, I'm not of the belief that you want to go and like stop by the company and try to pop into somebody's right, office right, and expect right. it. You know, maybe that would have worked in the 50s and 60s, possibly. They would have seen that as someone being proactive. Nowadays, they'll just call security and you're not going to make it very far. And they'll see that as being... Look, I also was talking to somebody who was, who was saying that um, if you're trying to find the hiring manager, try to call the company and try to get um, send the message or find the person's name. And that works, I mean, if you could do it, but also like there's a reason why they hide the names because they know nowadays in the social media world, the person who was posting the position, the hiring manager will be inundated by calls and emails if they would release the name. So if you could find it, that's great. I wouldn't be so proactive when you start calling up people in the office saying, hey, I'm looking to hire somebody for this, that, you know, can you tell me? They're trying to such a shtick to get around the fact that they're trying to keep, you know, keep the gate closed. And I would advise against that because they catch you, they're probably not going to be very happy. Right. And uh, you most probably won't get a job with them. <laughs> yeah, probably not with them. Yeah. Right. The detective, maybe. I don't know. Right. So is there any other tips or, you know, things you would tell someone to look out for when they're going through this process? Anything about the interview? Anything about? Well, I think, look, I think the first important thing is, especially somebody who's recently unemployed, don't blame yourself. 
And my philosophy on this is also that the way to sort of view it is your full-time job now is finding a job. But nobody works a full-time job 24 seven. So just because you're looking for a job doesn't mean the rest of your life is completely on hold, forget it. If you work normally eight hours a day, spend eight hours a day working towards your goals, engaging people on social media, sending out resumes, but do stuff at night, go out with your family, you know, enjoy yourself. If you can't spend money, go for a walk, go on a bike ride. You gotta keep living your life because when you get into this sort of sheltered mode that, oh gosh, I gotta find a job, I gotta find a job. You're not gonna be presenting yourself as well. And it's gonna come off in your interviews and in, in the way you're presenting yourself and it's not gonna help you, it's gonna hurt you. So it's very difficult. Again, I've been in a place where I needed a job. I really I had no money. I was out of work for five months. I was in a very desperate place. But it was a mistake to be so focused on the job because it just gave me tunnel vision. I wasn't able to see past a lot of things. And I just like I was too anxious to get it. So living your life, reading a book, you know, coming up with a hobby. These are all things that you want to do while you're looking for a job. But dedicate those eight hours like what your work hours, your work hours, your job search hours are your work hours. You're putting in that eight to five, whatever, nine to five and make you sure to do that, but live your life after that. Right. There's another less is more uh, rule, right? You're like putting in that yeah. extra hours, but it's hurting you in every way. Exactly. Exactly. And, and the other thing that I found, by the way, is that uh, spouses tend uh, to be, and I get it. If someone's spouse is, is unemployed, you know, they're, they're really anxious for their spouse to be employed because it's a family thing. And what I found when I've talked to the spouses of people who are looking for jobs, I need to tell them to sort of tone it down a little bit. Because look, if the person you're married to is, a legitimate good person, they're not happy about being employed. You know, coming and saying, oh, why aren't you looking for a job? Why aren't you doing this? Can't you do more? You're not changing anything in their perspective. All you're doing is making him or her feel bad about what they're doing and feel more remiss in the fact that they don't have a job. If they're doing the right things and they should be because they're a good person, just be encouraging, be supportive, be understanding, spend time, go on those walks and those bike rides, you know, go out to a dinner, whatever it is, to help keep them positive because being more positive is definitely more helpful when it comes to looking for a job. Right. Be more positive, work less. Basically, uh, uh, work, uh, not work less, work, you know, work those 24 sex. hours, right. It's COVID, 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 right. COVID, you have your work time set that you're going to be looking for a job, but live your life. And again, if it's your spouse, help your spouse live their life. You know, give them the opportunity to relax and unwind. You know, they'll make better job search candidates and better uh, potential people when you're able to do that. Because it really does get difficult. And I understand it. It's pressure, the bills are due, the tuition's due. You have to buy groceries, there's no money, and but just increasing the amount of anxiety and in and, and the house is not something that usually helps people who are looking for jobs. Right, exactly. All right, so that's awesome. And how could anyone reach you if they want, to, if they have any questions? So the easiest way to get me is on LinkedIn. Uh, pretty much everything is Chaim Shapiro. Um, so Chaim Shapiro at Gmail, Chaim Shapiro on Twitter, Chaim Shapiro on LinkedIn, and my Turo account, Chaim.Shapiro at Turo.edu. I'm pretty receptive and pretty easy to find. So if anybody wants to get a hold of me, please do so. And I'm glad to give whatever advice that I can. All right. So again, thank you so much for your time. This was Was it the first of its kind? That's the question. It was definitely the first of its it kind. It was the first of its kind. Okay, <laughs> we'll see. I have to connect back with you in like six weeks to see if I'm, you know, if, if there's a well, second and a third. But Right. We're going to hopefully we aim that each interview should be the first of its kind. Oh, that's there we go. But Listen, so that's going to be hard. If that is the case, then this jobs group will be the first of its kind. Well, I'm actually hoping this jobs group won't have to be around very long. No offense so, to you. Yeah. No offense to you. <laughs> no, ser I'm serious. No offense to you, but the shorter this is necessary, the better it is. And hopefully we get back right. to the point. How would you, how would you, employment. how would you, I'm saying jobs group have been around even before COVID. So how would you imagine sure. this, let's say the jobs group platform disappearing? Look, I, I don't think it will completely disappear, but the fact is the point, you know, that where we were at even, you know, a year ago where, you had 96% employment, there are still people who are always unemployed. And the, the value of the job board is still gonna be there. But I, what I'm trying to say is you don't wanna have it where basically you have to have large numbers of people who need the services at, at one time. Right. So you know, again, it'd be great if everyone was employed, that's never the case. But we were pretty close to almost complete employment you know, six months ago, a year ago. And by the way, the conversations were very interesting because everyone assumed everyone was employed and people come up to me who weren't and they didn't understand because people didn't understand there were people who were looking for jobs. So this will always be valuable. That was just one of a joke on my side. Right. But the point is, so it won't, it won't be as needed. For right. People, Meaning not have as the bad. employment right. that's fulfilling. Right. So it'll always be there as a resource, but it won't be something they need. Right. If we do our job well, we'll have less people in the group. Perfect. <laughs> and I'm glad to help with that in any way I can. All right. So thank you again for your time. And again, thank you. if you want to reach out to him, you can. And this is the end of the first of its kind. <laughs> All right, take care, Chaim. Have a great Thank day. Thank you.